Welcome, we're the Macomb County Genealogy Group. You can find MCGG at our blog website, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and at our YouTube channel. You can contact us at either of the listed emails seen here. The MCGG Friday Group has been meeting for over 48 years and our MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy Discussion Group has been meeting for 16 years. During this pandemic and the library's renovation, we are meeting virtually once a month as a combined meeting. Many MCGG members volunteer their time in a variety of ways to benefit the genealogy community and the Mount Clemens Public Library. This is the MCGG Friday, an MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy combined virtual meeting, June 8th, 2022. Our topic tonight is our first ever MCGG Member Medley Stories Presentations by our own MCGG members, Lisa Eschenberg, Mary Lou Duncan, and Dara Tolbert Brooks. If this is your first time attending a MCGG meeting, welcome. Attend a meeting and you are a member. MCGG has no dues. If you would like to be added to our mailing list, please send an email to the email shown on the screen. We try to keep our emails down to a reasonable number each month, mostly meeting reminders. And now for some announcements. This is our last meeting of the 2022 winter spring season. We hope you enjoyed our meetings. If you have any meeting topics or ideas, please email them to us at the Macomb Code GG Gmail address. On Tuesday, August 16th at 7 p.m., the Macomb County Genealogy Group will be helping the Harrison Township Public Library with a beginning genealogy and scanning party program. More details will be announced closer to the event date. There is a rumor out there that the Mount Clemens Public Library is getting rid of the genealogy room in the new library. Put the rumor mill to rest. What we know at this time is the Mount Clemens Library will continue to have a local history room. It will still have a focus on genealogy and local history. We will no longer have the large storage area, so we will need to color digitize some of the collection of the Macomb County Genealogy Group. A large number of books in the collection are duplicated online, so they can still be accessible for research. We will post more information as it becomes available. And we'll also email and notify other ways. The Mount Clemens Library, Public Library is planning a September reopening of its 150 Cass Avenue building. Therefore, our meeting in September will be virtual, and we're looking forward to hopefully begin doing hybrid meetings, both uh, in person and on Zoom in October. The Michigan Genealogical Council has asked genealogy groups to write their state senators and representatives. Governor Whitmer's fiscal year 2023 executive budget for the Department of Natural Resources includes 485,000 in one-time funding for the Archives of Michigan to digitize information that is preserved only on microfilm and cassette or reel-to-reel -reel tapes that are reaching their end of their life cycle, as well as some frequently used paper records, such as state census records, tax rolls, and indexes to 50 years of Wayne County probate records. The Michigan House of Representatives has adopted a budget that completely removes this line item. The Michigan Senate Appropriations Committee has adopted Senate Bill 839S2, which reduced the amount to 133,400, enough to make digital copies, but not enough for people to add the data that makes the digital files usable and searchable. The next steps in the budget process are conference committee work that involves the governor and both houses of the legislature. This is an excellent time for stakeholders to voice their support of the investments contained in the um, physical year 2023 executive budget, particularly archi archival record digitization that will preserve and provide access to records essential to Michigan business 
and legal transactions and used by family historians, us genealogists, government researchers and academics. Please urge your state senator and representative and encourage members of the soon to be named conference committee to include full funding for digitization, cataloging, et cetera. Check the Michigan Genealogical Council website for more information. Lisa will try to put together some additional information and email it to the group. Personalized messages, even short ones, tend to urge more action than form letters. This, that's all for the announcements, unless has, anyone has anything to note from another group. Okay, on to the meeting. Tonight's program is modeled after a program held by a few Ontario Genealogical Society branches. While its title varies, such as Spotlight or Great Moments, the, the essence is to give society slash group members a short time, like 15 to 20 minutes, to share a story from his or her research, be it a good moment or a bad moment or not so good. Sometimes a story teaches of using a resource, shares an eerie moment or moments, or just lets a member tell somebody else about their ancestor or family. All of these stories give the society group members an opportunity to participate and maybe stretch themselves a little bit. What participants tonight did not know prior is that besides recording of our meeting for our YouTube channel, each participant will receive an MP4 movie of just their own story presentation oh, right. so that may be shared with family members. Mm -hmm. First up is gonna be Lisa Eschenberg, then Mary Lou Duncan, and then Tara, Dara Tolbert Brooks. We'll have a short Q&A after each story. Um, so if you would please turn off your video and mute, mute your mics, I'm gonna turn, turn this over to Lisa. All right, I'm going to be talking tonight about what about Mary and George? I had quite a few topic ideas for this story presentation, several for my denim line, a couple for my rider line, and a few for some of my various German lines, but I went with a collateral line that was lost to time. I chose this story to tell because it illustrates the need to revisit what has been done before and repeat as necessary. In most cases, the longer you've researched, the more you have learned and the better you become. Um, techniques are developed, shared, and used when applicable. And it also shows that with the passage of time, more resources are likely available and more technological improvements happen to make records easier to access and use. It shows that even if it was someone else who did the earlier research, known or unknown to you, you need to review the research. Don't assume it is so because someone says. And this story shows that research often leads to more needed research, which is the case with this story. This is part of a family line that originally got us into genealogy. Our family had visited dad's cousin Don on his family farm. While his kids played with the lamb in the corner of the kitchen, um, yeah, we were quite young. Um, my mom, dad, and sister Cindy talked with Don and his wife about the family history, some of which Don's wife learned from great aunt Minnie, an aunt of dad and Don's fathers. Later, dad would wanna know if it was true his third great grandfather Seneca was a revolutionary, was in the Revolutionary War. That was the main thing that started our adventure. But part of the story told that day was that Seneca and his wife helped raise dad and Don's great grandmother, Sarah, and her sister, Mary. Their father was said to have died about two or three months before Mary was born. As we traced our direct line and filled in the collateral lines, information on Mary was hard to come by and decipher. They were told that day the family moved with friends from Canada to St. Clair County, Michigan. Later, we would learn the specific wares involved. Later, we would learn vital records did not start until 1869 in Ontario and many of our ancestor events were before that. And even though vital records in Michigan started in 1867, it took a while before recording one's events with the local government was filed especially in Muzzy Township, or at least it seemed to us. Um, church records for the areas were not readily available. In some cases, when they were found, they were not well kept, which was very disappointing after having used German church records, which are usually a rich resource in information. We did not 
find Mary in any documents until finding part of the family on the 1880 census. This was in the days of cranking the microfilm and manually searching record images, hoping the handwriting was fairly legible and that the film itself was fairly readable. There we discovered Mary with a son, George W., which brought up more questions than answers. Um, my mother and sister did a lot of this early research. Just before computers and then the internet started to make their impact on the hobby. Um, Mary would be found on two earlier census enumerations, but after this 1880 census, only on the 1884 Michigan State Census. She would also be found on a marriage record along with a birth and a death of a daughter. No death record or burial place has been found. No interesting tidbits in the newspapers. I was going to show you the additional records, but I decided a timeline would do as well with one slide. This timeline sums up what we learned up to that point about Mary and George. We had found no obituaries, no news items, no death records for Mary. So Mary E. was born about 1855 or 1856, likely in Maydock Township, but without a record, it is a guess. In 1861, the girls Sarah, Eliza, and Mary E. are found on the census with their maternal grandparents, just like the story told, us, told to us. Their mother, Mahalia, was not in the household. Neither is the father, Joseph Vincent. In fact, he is never found on any record of this time with Mahalia or the girls. The marriage, the girls' births, and his death all would have happened between the census years. In 1870, Mary is found with her maternal grandmother living in an aunt-uncle's home. Uh, her mother and sister are not present. Later, we would realize that her mother was likely in Hastings County trying to get her father's probate settled. Um, there's some documents showing that she was over there at that point, but she left before the 1871 census. I very recently, specifically last week, found Sarah as a domestic finally in Bruce Township, Macomb County. From the 1880 census, we estimate Mary's son, George W., was born about 1878, but no birth record could be found, and he's listed as a Vincent on the census, so we weren't sure of that situation. In 1881, we found Mary marrying a John A. Kane. One question raised was, how did they meet? He resided in Bay City at the time of the marriage. In 1883, a daughter, Jane A., was born in October, at which time John is residing in Saginaw. In December of 1883, daughter Jane dies, and John is still residing in Saginaw. The 1884 state census is the last we see of Mary, as I said before, and she is noted as married, but again, no husband is with her. At this time, her son George W. carries the surname Kane. Of course, the 1890 census was destroyed, so the next option, depending on your Michigan county, is the 1894 Michigan state census. We don't find Mary. George W. Kane is living with his grandparents, Orrin and Mahalia, now in Lapeer County. Mahalia answers two kids, one living, which means for us, Sarah is alive. She dies in 1921, and Mary is deceased by 1894. It narrows the time frame, but still no concrete answers were found regarding her death. Questions still remain, so more research is needed. A recheck of the 1900 census shows no Mary E. Vincent or Mary E. Kane of any spelling and George Vincent or George Kane of any spelling that matched our Mary and George. This added additional proof that Mary had died before 1894 and that George was likely dead before 1900. A search for George back in microfilm times uh, found his death in Burnside Township, Lapeer County. What was odd is that we eventually found two death records in the county register book for George. I think we were doing a page by page search for any family members of a variety of family names and that's how we discovered there were two death records. Though similar, there are differences between the records. A check of the state level death records 
found only one death record, which matched record number 7233. The one that happens to have a little bit more information. We can't recall which came first, the obituary or the state death certificate. We think it was the obituary after finding the county level death register entries and maybe even the state level death register entry. This gave us the story. George Kane falls on a butcher knife. They were butchering pigs and he was assisting and an accident occurred. Um, don't you wish microfilm printers printed a date of the printout discreetly somewhere on the page or that we had thought to record the date? Um, this is prior to the genealogy wave still occurring of keep a research log and make a research plan. If I had been doing that at that point, which it wasn't a big genealogy issue, I'd have that date. Okay, so in October 2006, when the state first released the death certificates on microfilm at the Library of Michigan, we made a list and searched and printed those wonderful death certificates for our ancestors. We discovered yet another death record for George. This one seemed to combine information from the two county level records, but also provided other details that neither county level record had on them nor on the state register format. Why don't you just love this certificate format and wish they used it much earlier? So a thought came to me while making this presentation. Yes, we had the death certificate for years, but how did the digitization end up? I hadn't bothered to look for the digital version because we had it already. I scanned the photocopy that we made years ago, but I took a look and it ended up more readable than the photocopy we made from microfilm many years ago. So go back and look at those documents you already have. You may find more readable versions. So now that we could better read the cause of death on the certificate, which is more detailed than the death record versions, um, and even one of those had no cause entered. So it clearly now says a wound in rectum from butcher knife which is the obituary telling us the story. So in 2008, I was prompted to pick up the research on Mary and George. All this stuff happened before then. So after one of mom's surgeries, I came across a nearby county genealogy society's newsletter in the mail. Among the articles was some filler material from old issues of the Port Huron newspapers. One article rang familiar and I realized it was really about our George Kane, but the article said it was George King. It took a month or so to get to the Port Huron library to get a copy of the newspaper microfilm. On the half hour or so drive back home, and yes, it should have took a little longer to get home, but I was uh, really thinking about what was coming next. Um, I realized that if that paper picked the story up, how many others did as well? It hits on several bells that would make it a reason to be picked up by other newspapers. And sure enough, we discovered George King, AKA George Kane's death was widely reported with varying details. You might notice that the Port Huron Daily Times and thus the Detroit Free Press reported George's death before he actually died. So sometimes you're gonna find what you seek elsewhere. Cass City, Pickney, Ludington, and there may be more. These articles were found towards the beginning of newspaper di digitization. I really should do the search again, and I had planned to, but other things came up. Um, so there are probably even more historical newspapers that carried this story that have been digitized. But as we know, not everything we want is digitized yet. 
So in the time since we searched vital records by microfilm, they've been digitized, indexed, and placed online. So a new search of vital records in a new way was called for, as well as a review of what we had already done, especially since it's been had been more than 10 years. But this review would take some time. It was an instantaneous job because there's other things going on in life. So as far as we know, George never married. He likely did not have any children. It's a po Is it a possibility? Of course, but we don't think very likely. So as I said, this line was lost to time, but it is a good research challenge for me. Unfortunately though, DNA is not gonna be of help here. So with a more concrete birth date figured by hand and by website calculator as the 11th of March or 12th of March, 1878, um, I sought out a birth record for George once more. Using those online versions and various ways to search, I came up with one interesting result. A George W. Cooley born March 13th, 1878 in Muzzy Township, the son of a Samuel P. Cooley of Muzzy born in New York and a Mary E. Cooley of Muzzy born in Canada. Now in reviewing what we had prior, I noticed something we did, had not or didn't, don't think we had noted before, on the 1880 census, Mary E. Vincent was not just marked or ticked in the widow divorce column, but it was actually a D for divorce. George's entry gave his birthplace as Michigan with the father born New York and mother Ontario. Have you noticed that answers are closer to the truth the closer they are to the event? These lines, this lines up with Samuel P. Cooley's birthplace and Just across the road from the Burr's household, highlighted in yellow on this map, lived for a short time Samuel Cooley and Jeremiah T. Cooley, highlighted in green, which appears between OJ's two plots of land. Yes, look at those friends, associates, and neighbors, the fan club. Samuel Cooley bought his land October 1st, 1873 from Roswell and Nancy Raymond, or Raymond, and Samuel and his wife, Amy Cooley, sold the property March 7th, 1877 to George W. Hodge. Jeremiah T. Cooley bought his land April 3rd, 1874 from Roswell and Nancy. Amy Cooley was a witness and he sold the property August 9th, 1879 to Gould Mead. Warren J. Burris was a witness, George's step-grandfather. Now, Samuel and Amy, whose maiden name is Phillips, had a son, Samuel, born in 1844 in New York or Michigan, according to some census. But Samuel married Mary J. Simmons, a.k.a. Laura, in May of 1878. Was he George's father or was there another Samuel about his age? Jeremiah signed off the land by himself, meaning he was not married at the time. So was he never married or was he a widower? But how but who was he? How old? Where was he born? A Jeremiah Cooley cannot be found in the census, marriage or death records. We know he likely had some sort of relationship to Samuel and Amy based on the witnessing of the land. Uh, but what kind of relationship? The lineage of Samuel, husband of Amy, is known, but there is no mention of a Jeremiah T anywhere in the Cooley family history. A Jeremiah T. Cooley is only on the land records here, buying, selling, taking out a mortgage, and this plat map. So checking a gestational uh, cal calculator, yes, I go the full range for my research here. If George was a full-term baby, which averages 40 weeks, then he would have been conceived in mid-June 1877, a first child, usually late, sometimes early. So we've just got an average here, uh, an estimate. So while Samuel and Amy's family moved to Lapeer County before this, it still makes their son Samuel as the possible Samuel P. Cooley, uh, father of George W. Cooley, born March 13th, 1878. The family likely visited their family and their old neighbors. Um, and yes, I did check for death record and an 1880 
census record for George Cooley born 1878 about, and there was none found. So what do we know? Though I can't really say he did it himself, George is amazingly consistent with his age year of birth, the complete opposite of his great grandmother Martha, who is another story. Though I don't have solid evidence, it is my belief and gut feeling that George was not the son of John Kane, even though later records for George seem to indicate it. Um, I believe that was a case of assuming the stepfather's name. I think that George W. Cooley birth record is our George W. The Cooleys and Mary were neighbors, cross the street neighbors. Were they, were they really married? I don't know. Record keeping by civil and church were very spotty in this area. But I rather think not. It's probably just, well, we'll, we'll say she's divorced. Um, I have looked for a marriage record in St. Clair, Lapeer, Oakland, Macomb. In fact, all of Michigan and in Ontario. Um, I have done just an overall search on ancestry and family search without a match. Of course, it's only going to find the stuff that's indexed, electronically indexed. But I've also looked manually on microfilm. Uh, I've also looked for divorce records in Macomb County and physically in St. Clair County, but need to go to Lapeer County Clerk's Office to check Lapeer's yet. This would be before 1897. So divorces are all before 1897 in Michigan are all are with all the other chancery and circuit court matters. I'm not sure when secret marriages and probate courts started, and there's that relatedness to the Cooley of Cooley Law School, notoriety to consider was anything going on there. Um, but Samuel ends up marrying in, in May 1878 in Lapeer to another woman just two months after George's birth. Could there be two Samuel Cooleys close to the same age? Yes, there are a few in Macomb County, cousins to him, but none with such a close association within Mary E's realm of life. Since Jeremiah T. Cooley remains a ghost and a dead end, right now I think the likely suspect is Samuel and Amy's son um, for the father of George W. But more research is needed, of course. So I have a few things on my to-do list here. So we've gotten to George to a point, we've gotten George to a point that more on-site on research is what is left. So let's get back to Mary. So now let's open up Mary's timeline. In earlier research, we narrowed the time frame of Mary's death to after the 1884 Michigan State Census and before the 1894 state state census. So after June 1st, 1884, and before June 1st, 1894. And while 10 years is a narrow stretch of time, it still leaves a lot of time for various things to happen. So again, using the electronic indexes with various ways to search by, I came up with one interesting result. Electronically, looking for a death record brought up no possibilities. But a search of marriage records, just for the heck of it, brought up an interesting find. A marriage in 1886 between a Robert McLaughlin of Emily and Mary E. Kane of Muzzy, age 30, which means born about 1856 in Ontario. Unfortunately, in this time frame, they were not asked how many times prior married and neither were they asked about their parents, which would have been really helpful. But from prior research, I know there were no other Kane King families in Muzzy Township. Another supporting piece of evidence is that witness, Henry Martin of Muzzy Township. One of the other oh. neighbors in 1880 was Samuel Martin, who had a son, Henry, who would have been 23 years, 23 years old in 1886 and old enough to be a witness. A check of the 1894 Michigan census showed Robert was a widower by that census. Unfortunately, there was not a question asking how long widowed. So this also supports that this could be our Mary. We may have cut another four years off the window of time for Mary's death to have occurred. 
Searches were then done electronically for a death record for Mary McLaughlin, which turned up nothing in Lapeer, St. Clair, Oakland, Macomb, all of the state. A burial place was sought to without success. Probate was negative. Newspaper searches so far have resulted in nothing, though not everything is digitized and still more needs to be searched. I was torn between Mount Clemens and Lapeer for the hashtag Dig newspaper grant this year. I wanted both to win. Um, church records were searched, but the most likely church that the family attended had abysmal record keeping in that early time period and quite frankly, in most of its early existence. My paternal grandfather was baptized there and I have the baptismal um, Taufschein is what we call it in German, but the baptismal certificate, um, but he's not in their books. I looked. So research has been uh, done on the many times married Robert McLaughlin and none of which, none of which has helped to find Mary. So again, the to-do list is researching the early Lapeer and KPAC newspapers for key dates involved. And this is going to involve going to the Library of Michigan or up to Lapeer to the society and the museum there. Um, where does this leave us? More, search, more research to do and more questions to ask. So what about John A. Kane? Mary E. Vincent's documented husband who never appears on a census with her. If she married again in 1886, did John A. Kane die or did they divorce? Or did Mary not worry about him so much and marry again anyways? At the top in the purplish color are the known document facts about Mary E. Vincent's John Kane, John A. Kane. He was born in Canada, likely New Brunswick, but maybe Nova Scotia, but that was from secondhand information on George W's death certificate. So it's probably less reliable. He was involved in carpentry work. He initially resided in Bay City, but apparently made the move to Saginaw by 1884. Using these scant facts as clues, a search of census and directories and of course death records was performed. A search of divorce records was done as previously noted, but not of Saginaw County yet. I have to go up there just in case he initiated a, a divorce. Um, those records aren't digitized and online yet. A John Kane was found on the 1880 census in Bay City, who was a close match to our clues. Though as a ship carpenter, it's questionable if he might've been on a ship and maybe missed by the census. And not to mention, when did he arrive in Michigan? Um, so an additional match to that 1880 census entry seems to show that John Kane was still in Bay City in 1881 through the directories. Again, how did these two people meet? Is this Mary's John? Um, a check of the 1883 Bay City directory seems to show a John Kane and John Kane um, two different spellings, but neither mention carpentry or woodworking, just laborer. So it's hard to know with those two. A check of the 1883 Saginaw directory shows several Kane and Kane families, different spellings, including two Johns. All of this is promising, but does not provide conclusive proof. Death record searches have resulted in no matches yet. A better search of newspapers, Saginaw, Lapeer, and KPAC is needed. Most aren't digitized yet. Unfortunately, though, Bay County has surviving 1884 and 1894 Michigan State Census, but Saginaw County has neither, so that research possibility is voided. The 1890 veteran schedule provided no clues, and so John remains an enigma. An enigma. So the last question is one of the reasons I picked up and searched a line lost to time. What about Joseph Vincent? Besides my own direct line, his daughter, Sarah Eliza, her sister, Mary E. Vincent, is the only other branch of the tree that could provide some clues to who was their father. He marries their mother after the 1851 census. They had both Sarah and Mary before the next census in 1861, and he is said to have died two or three months before Mary was born, and her birth year is unsure, 1855 or 1856. 
A search of the 1851 census does not find any Vincent family in the township where Mahalia's family is. There is one nearby, one family nearby in a nearby township, but no Joseph. There is a Joseph Vincent on Prince Edward County, but he is not with a Vincent family. So his connections are unknown and unsure to either of the Vincent families on Prince Edward County. And I say on because Prince Edward County is also an island, not to be confused with Prince Edward Island. Um, and like I said at the beginning, civil records do not start until later. Church records have not been located yet for the church the family attended in Madoc Township. Newspapers closest to this area, again, do not start early enough. And we have no clue of the age of our Joseph Vincent in order to determine if we have found a viable candidate for him. DNA is a possibility though, with Joseph being a third great grandfather, we're getting to the edge of the cliff with DNA usability. I have searched matches with surname in various locations, Ontario, Hastings County, Prince Edward County, and a few others without any concrete clues. There are a couple matches with lower Santa Morgan numbers that appear to be a French Canadian background family living in the Kingston area, but there is not much information on the family. Records again are sparse for the area, so it is difficult to tell if the matches ancestress, which they all come from the same woman, is an only child or if there are siblings and extended family. I'm of the Gibbs gut that the Prince Edward County Vincents are more likely, but they appear to be from New York originally and Methodist, which means spotty records again the trial of my life. Um, so genealogy fairy, I need some Hastings, Prince Edward and Frontenac County, Ontario, Vincent families to DNA test, please. And as you can see, I'm actually not done with this research. So this story shows all of you that you do have stories in your research too, even if you are not done yet. And lastly, I would like to note that the family photos included here came from a dear cousin I have not met in person yet but have been corresponding with for years after she found me using a member surname list through the Ontario Genealogical Society. I had had for some time on my computer a partially written letter to her introducing us and our family um, passion, genealogy, family history. That's my presentation, everyone. Thank you for listening. Any questions for Lisa? You can unmute if you want to or put it in the chat. Oh, I had a question. Um, sure. That's the first time I saw a nice uh, plat map uh, that you had there. Um, how did you obtain that? Um, trying to remember which way, which route I did. If you, let me share my screen again. And okay, if you go to our um, website, and I put it in the chat at the beginning of this, and go to the links. <laughs> Then um, down here under, um, there we go, under Michigan related websites, I have links that will take you to um, where you can see the St. Clair County atlases that are digitized by, um, I think it's University of Michigan, if I recall. Yes. Uh, Michigan County histories and atlases brought to us by University of Michigan. Um, so I've got Macomb County links there, St. Clair County, Lapeer, Oakland, Wayne, and Washtenaw. I also have a link to an 1859 wall map for Macomb and St. Clair counties. And so you just um, find the page that you want it, you want, and then um, bring it up. I would say sh show it at 400% and then um, download that select the download for that image and you'll get the largest image. You can also find a variety of atlases and maps for various locations through the Library of Congress and also Ancestry has some. So I just downloaded the, the JPEG uh, image and then I have Photoshop so I was able to bring it in and tweak it for the section that I wanted and tweak the colors too. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? This is Dara. I, I don't have any questions, but I have some comments. 
um, I, I like the fact that you used a variety of resources and you presented them to us in a variety of ways. Um, you know, we, we all decide how much information we're going to put on the screen, but it, it's, it, it's good to see a mixture of resources, which says to us that we need to check all available resources. can't get to them, make a list and <laughs> wait until you can. <laughs> I wanted to also show that, you know, even though you're not done, because sometimes you're never done, um, there is a way to make a story. Anyone else? Lisa, this uh -huh. is Beverly. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm glad it's over with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it was a really good presentation. Thank you so Thank much you. for putting that together. And I, I really uh, am jealous of the different ways you did present, uh, as was just said. How did you get all of your timelines? Because the clarity was fantastic. You know how, I mean, the, the way the, um, the person viewing it can really put it together. How did you do that? Okay. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, and watch our February meeting. Um, I show you how to make a timeline in either PowerPoint slides or presentations. So it's basically just a line I drew across. I decided to make a dotted. Um, I made some circles of you know a size and gave it a contrasting color. I drew a line between the circles and I grouped all that together. And so that's my stick on the timeline. And really, you just kind of eyeball it, you know, what's your beginning date, what's your end date, and then you add some text. And then, because I had a lot of text, I varied it up and down in order that it wasn't, wasn't too crowded. So it, it's really not too bad. There is a, um, I think, a timeline feature in PowerPoint. I think the others have it too, but um, this is just the easiest and quickest way to get a nice large timeline that was readable. Very good, thank you. Yes, yeah, so you can watch the February uh, meeting and learn some tricks. Thanks, I will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, just, just email me. <laughs> Anything else? All right, Mary Lou, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Mary Lou. All right. This is about Thomas Kingston, an Irish immigrant to Detroit. Next. What really intrigued us was this letter from George Kingston to his grandson, Russell Fleming, on his 16th birthday. And it accompanied a pocket watch that was a stem wine pocket watch, which came from Ireland. He says, only an old relic, my, my boy, not very handsome to look at, valuable only for its age, and it's nearly old enough to vote. It belonged originally to my father's grandfather, my great-grandfather, your father's great-great-grandfather, and your great-great-grandfather three times over. It traveled to this big country 65 years ago in the possession of my Uncle Joe, who promised me 50 years ago that after his death, it would be mine. It has been in my possession for 15 years, and I now take great pleasure in giving it to my eldest and well-beloved grandson, Russell, at the same time wishing you many, many happy returns of the day and hoping you will still be in possession of it to turn over to your grandson 70 years from now. Love from your old granddad, Georgie Kingston. This was a watch that in the back, if you opened it, had a slip of paper that said Thomas Kingston, 10 May, 1760, Crohane. Crohane was a townland in Ireland that he'd come from. And that was a birth date. Next. This is a Kingston line as far as we've been able to figure it out. There's Thomas Kingston at the top, then George, his son, then the Thomas Kingston that we're going to be talking about, and then his son, George, and then my grandfather, Samuel, my mother, Marion, and me. Next. This is a 
the stone that was erected by Thomas Kingston, the one born in 1760, and it's in Clonakilty, Cork, Ireland. We were able to find this because we knew the name and we knew the townland. You have to know the townland in Ireland to really be able to do anything because that's how they identify where someone lives. And there are over 60,000 townlands in Ireland. He says it's a burying place of his family in memory of his wife, Anne, who departed this life April 11th, 1811. Although there's an iron railing around it, we did not find any tombstone for Thomas. And uh, although I know when he died, I have no idea where he's buried, but I assume it's here. And unfortunately, the church has no uh, listing of any kind of where people are buried in the cemetery. And to follow the Kingston name, you really have to have a first name and have a townland. A few years ago, uh, the, the Catholic church, uh, there's one in the town, released the uh, records that they had. And when I went online, I thought, oh, great, I can look, check here. There were over 500 people by the name of Kingston that were listed in that, uh, that listing, and I have not checked all of them. Unfortunately, because of the troubles in Dublin in uh, 1920, 22 area, uh, the church records were sent into for safekeeping to Dublin and they were destroyed. So they have nothing below, I would think it was about 1878, they have records from there forward, but not before that. Next. But knowing the townland, we were able to find Crohane East townland, which is a small townland. And it's not very far from Clonakilty. You know, we found Thomas Kingston. This is not the original, this is a grandson, but this is George Kingston, Thomas's son, and George Kingston Jr. I have a feeling that that's one of the reasons that the three sons came to the United States and came to Detroit was because they knew they couldn't get the land. Uh, it was already going to be going to their brothers. This is a uh, supposedly the Kingston home in Ireland on, on Crohane are the remains of it. And I think I'm rather impressed because it has two stories inside. We went inside when I was over there. I've been over there twice uh, to this area. And, but there was a farmer there that said, oh yes, this was the old Kingston homestead. Next. Thomas Kingston came over here and was married in 1843 at St. Paul's Parish. St. Paul's Parish was down on Woodward, closer to Corktown, but it moved up when they built the cathedral. And he married Sarah Ann Ward. We have her supposedly her parents' names, uh, and she was supposedly the first white child born on Walpole Island in the St. Clair River on the Canadian side in 1826. He moved later to St. Peter's Episcopal Church, which was closer to Corktown and right down in the middle of Corktown. And he was listed as a vestryman there. Next. When you're looking in the census as we did for Thomas Kingston and his friends, and not his friends, but his family, uh, we had difficulty finding them in the 1860 census because there was no Kingston of the right family makeup. But if you check the na names and ages of the children, we finally found it under Thomas Naughton. The only thing I can figure out is perhaps it was somebody with a German background that was interviewing someone with an Irish accent and they didn't get the Kingston name right. But we found it by looking for the first names of the children and family. Next. The Declaration of Intent is listed as having occurred in Detroit, but the records are held in the National Archives branch in Chicago. And the only reason that we knew where to find it was because the naturalization records of the Circuit Court of Eastern Michigan had been moved there. And someone from the Chicago area copied the ones from Michigan and they were published in DSGR magazine. So it always helps to look at the magazine of a local genealogical society and see what they have. 
he stated while he, when he applied for his declaration of intent, that he came to Michigan the year before it became a state. It became a state January 1837 officially, but he may have come earlier with his brother Samuel as Samuel got land in Macomb County in 1837. And in that time period, you needed to be here for two years before you could get land. So I have a feeling that maybe he came in 1835. And an old friend said in a newspaper article that he had, came, had come in 1835. Next. Unfortunately, there were a couple of years of very tragic events that took place in the Kingston family. One of the sons of Samuel and Sarah was cleaning his pistol in the kitchen and it was loaded and it went off and hit his mother in the abdomen. She only lived until the next day and died because they couldn't remove the fatal bullet. She left a family without a mother. And when I researched recently, I found that she evidently had just given birth to a child, her last child, Ward Kingston, a month before in June. He only lived for the, till the end of July and he died. So there was another death there. Uh, in 1865, less than a year later, my own great grandfather was 17 years old and he was playing with his gun and chasing his brother about the yard. And the one boy, according to the story we were told, said he was, could duck behind a barrel before his brother could shoot at him. Well, the brother shot and hit him and he was killed instantly. Uh, there was a jury inquest and he decided it was an accident. There's another story that says that he was, his brother was teasing him and he chased him into the kitchen and held the gun to his head and it went off. They decided it was an accident and he was let off, but he had been taken into custody. But the thing that I thought was interesting, it says, no parent should permit his young boy to go about with a loaded pistol and boys should understand that they risk their own and the lives of their fellows by so doing. I guess that hasn't changed in 150 years. Next. Another death that occurred in 1865 was a six-year-old boy in the family who went out into the barn and saw a, a bottle of horse liniment and drank it and died from that. So there were a lot of deaths at that time. These were times that his name was get listed in a newspaper and this was Thomas Kingston's barn was burned. Thomas was a drayman, which meant he had a wagon with a horse and he used to uh, take loads of, for people in its train station or, or loads of business to the businesses around town in that area. At three o'clock yesterday morning, a barn owned by Thomas Kingston at the corner of 8th and Abbott was entirely consumed by fire. A valuable horse, also the property of Mr. Kingston was burned to death. Total lost about $400. This was in 1876. So without a horse, I'm sure that Thomas had to have other work to do. Well, I, this is what I did, discovered in looking for a search for Thomas Kingston. He evidently was a saloon keeper at one time after this, his horse died. Then he was supposed to go into court for not paying his liquor bill and his liquor taxes. And it says, Thomas Kingston sent, sent down a boy to inform the court that he was sick abed, but no physician's affidavit accompanied the information. Kingston was ordered rearrested. This was in December 1891. In 1892, took him a long time, I guess, to follow through on these court cases. It says, Thomas Kingston was found guilty, but he was quit the saloon business, has a large family, and depends on the poor commission for support. Suspended sentence. Next. This was in interesting, and I didn't know this until I looked again for Thomas Kingston in the newspaper. 
he boarded us an open Fort Street car, street car. And there being no seat, he stood on the footboard. He claims that the conductor, while passing him, crowded him off and he sustained a fractured thigh as a result of the fall. He sued for damages. On the first trial of the case, two terms ago, the jury failed to agree. The case was concluded this morning. This is 1895 and was a trial for an 1891 streetcar accident. At that time, the streetcars were horse drawn and they had rows of seats across and then they had a running board that ran the whole length. He says that the, the conductor pushed him off. The conductor said that he was drunk at the time and he didn't push him off. So there are many trials on this and there was a delay until 1897. And four trials later, he won and he won a $2,000 damage for having been pushed off. And, and this was probably the reason that he could not appear for the liquor control because he was still in bed. At that time, they didn't do much for a broken hip. Next. And the reason that he won was because there was a reversal of the lawsuit by the Michigan Supreme Court. And I never knew that a case of this type would go to the Supreme Court of Michigan. And there, what they said was, there were two reasons that they were reversing it. They said, intoxicated passengers, it was a duty of the conductor. The fact that conductor of a streetcar knows that a person who's standing on the running board outside the car is intoxicated imposes upon him the duty to exercise care in passing by such person for the purpose of collecting fares. The earlier trials had shown that he had bad habits and that he had had a, a job previously. He'd worked for a Union Depot elevator company for seven years. Why was he discharged? Because he was inebriated. They were trying to attack his character. And the Supreme Court said, you, can't, you can attack the character only in relationship to the time of the accident. You can say that he was drunk at the accident or have reports that he was drunk, but you can't go back years ago and say at another time he had, was drunk or he was in the habit of drinking intoxicating liquor. So this time, they, when they went back and re, redid the trial, he won and won the $2,000. Next. By 1896, Thomas was mentally incompetent. Perhaps it had been because he'd been in bed that long, or maybe it was just from old age. And there were many uh, appearances in court to get a petition to, for a guardian for Thomas. Uh, they, at first they appointed Thomas Kingston Jr., his son as guardian, but then because of the treatment he was getting at Thomas Kingston's house, they finally appointed Annie Markley, who was a daughter in 1899, February 7th, not very long before he died. Next. <coughs> Excuse me. I was very amazed to find this. And I've been researching this for 40 years and I had not looked other than obituaries and perhaps a birth listing for Thomas Kingston or any of the Kingstons because they were very poor people. And I didn't think they'd show up in the newspaper. But there was this whole article in it that I found last fall by using a search for Thomas Kingston. And old Tom was going home to die. This was when the uh, guardianship was changed and he just wanted to go to his own home that he'd had for 40 years. He was now 90 years old. And the house the, that he had had before, where he'd lived almost continuously since 1840, was the first house built on Abbott Street, west of Eights. Then in the township of Springwells, it wasn't even within the city limits of Detroit, Detroit because the city limits only extended to Eighth Street. Says so for half a century, he was a drayman, familiar about the freight depots of the cities, now two feeble and too ill to converse connectedly. Says that Kingston had a horse, which he called Mike, a very intelligent animal, 
he was very much attached to, having driven him for a great many years. Among the firms he worked for were the Evening News and H.H. H. Cole, who kept a wholesale liquor store on Michigan Avenue, where the Cadillac Hotel now stands now. And it's said that the horse could always tell whether he had a load of paper or whiskey, for he'd been known to leave the depot at different times without a driver, and he never missed pulling up with his cargo at the proper destination. On these occasions, Tom would shake his head at the horse as he philosophically remarked, you're all Mike, when you die, I'll quit working. When Mike finally died, the old man, true to his word, ceased his toil, but he followed the horse to the boneyard and sitting on the carcass, shed tears and refused to be comforted. A kinder hearted man never lived than old Tom. And the boys around Corktown tell stories of yet how on a Christmas day, he would bring out his old plug hat, full to the brim with nickels and pennies, which he'd been saving for a year, and fill the two fists of every lad who came to see him. He was possessed of considerable property at one time, but is now said to be in very poor circumstances. Next. There was actually a very good obituary for him in the paper that told about the fact that he had at one time had more property and that he was born in Ireland. This was in 18, March 5th, 1899, which was not very long after the February change of, of guardianship. So he did die in his old home as he wished. Next. But that took us to a transcript of the certificate of death. He was living at 262 Abbott Street. And that land, we looked for the house later, but it was torn down to make a parking lot for the old Briggs Stadium. And he was a team, said he was a teamster. It gave his father's name, but it did not give his mother's name. Said he died of old age and general debility. And he was buried in Elmwood Cemetery. It also said he had had 12 children and there were only five living. Elmwood Cemetery has a plot for Kingston's, but there are very, I think there are only three or four markers in it, but there are 32 graves in that, both for the Kingston family and friends of theirs who may have been uh, related to them back in Ireland, I don't know. Next. And after he died, there was a letter, a transcript of a letter from Sophie Kingston Jones, who was the only Kingston who moved out of state. She married a man who was a railroader and they moved to Terrell, Texas. And it was to her sister, Annie Markley. And she said, I received your letter some time ago. I wrote to Dora today, I'm sorry to her little home is mortgaged. I thought it was clear. Of course, I knew the taxes hadn't been paid, but never knew that they had to raise money to it. And that hound over there has everything. She's referring to my great grandfather, George. Annie, if you saw a lawyer and told him all about the $10 a month, don't you think George would have to pay all the money that he should have paid to poor father? Dora said he never paid it. If she could get that money, it would pay for the funeral expenses. I can't see why George should have everything that was his father's and not even be expected to pay the funeral expenses. Well, probably while uh, Thomas, was still able to converse and had some of his mind about him. He made a deal with his son, George, that if George would take care of him and give him $10 a month, and in turn for that, he would give George property that he owned and George would have the house. But evidently George never paid. He paid for a short time, but then he never paid again. And so they took him to court after this letter from Annie and did require him to pay $500 in back to money that he should have paid before for his father when he was alive. She also said in a letter that she had had a letter from an old neighbor after Thomas, the son, was taken care of as a guardian for his father, saying that he was treated so terribly by his son Thomas and his family. He had a number of children and they put him outside some of the time with no shoes on, so he was barefoot or let him wander about for hours and not checked on him, and that they weren't taking care of him well, and that, that uh, 
Sophie should come home from Texas and take care of her father. But this came in 1899 after her, her father had died. Next. I, I concentrated on Thomas mainly to show you how many different sources we went to. My brother went around to all the grandchildren that he could find of Thomas Kingston. When he went around to see them in the 1950s, many of them were still alive, but they were elderly. And some of them, each place had something that had come from the Kingston family that they could give him, whether it was a letter or information or a photograph. Also came from a personal visit to Ireland, both by my brother and by me several times. And it came from family data that my grandfather had from his grandfather. It came from Griffith's valuation records on family search, from DSGR magazine that I just recently found I could search for him a surname, uh, all the old copies, because I'm a member. Declaration of Intent for Citizenship was DSGR magazine. We wouldn't have known where to find it otherwise. The deeds, Wayne County deed indexes, and I was able to prove that he did buy land before 1840 in that area of Springwells. Detroit City directories, I checked at the Burton Collection, Detroit Public Library before very many of them were online, to see where the Kingstons lived and how many Kingstons were listed. Census was for on ancestry. Newspaper articles were newspaper search of both the Evening News, Detroit News, and the Detroit Free Press. But one thing you have to remember is you need to search not only by the surname, which I can't really do with Kingston uh, in anything because Kingston, Ontario, Kingston, Jamaica, and all the Kingstons around the world come up if you do that. So you use a first name, but my grandfather was named Samuel. He was Samuel Robert. He was a banker in Detroit. And there are articles in the newspaper under Samuel Kingston, Samuel R. Kingston, S.R. Kingston. And you have to search for those independently so that you don't miss anything. And even if you have somebody who's poor and you don't think that they'll show up in there, you may find that they will show that there will be a death notice or some kind of an article. Don't forget to check under the court records because lots of times in Corktown, especially, people show up in those court records, and my ancestors are among them. The Supreme Court reversal I searched Google Books, Michigan Reports and Cases, because I had seen a newspaper article that it said that the Supreme Court had reversed it. I thought, well, maybe I'll look and find something. In competency, competency and guardianship, Wayne County probate files had these, and there are many, many pages of them. Uh, the, are handwritten and a lot of them are hard to read, but figuring out the guardianship twice before he died. The death certificate was originally obtained from microfilm because I did most of my original research on microfilm or going to the places. And I think about it now and I think old time is gone, but every time I see one of my DNA results, it shows somebody of a different surname, but from that area of Cork, I think maybe old time, you're not gone yet because your DNA comes down in my bloodline. And that's the story of Thomas Kingston of Detroit, a poor man, but he lives on. Any questions? Hi, this is Judy. I had a question. Um, the newspaper articles, because I'm struggling with newspaper articles. Um, did you get those from that newspaper.com or where did you get the newspaper articles? Uh, most of them, I. Well, the one time I subscribed, I think it was only $7 for a month for the Detroit Free Press archives. Uh, but lately I've been getting it through my library card to the Library of Michigan, which has, uh, I think the Detroit News on it. it has, but it has newspapers on it. Okay, thank you. And you can get, you can get a news, uh, uh, if you live in Michigan, you can get a Michigan uh, 
Michigan Library library card just by oh. going on online. I didn't go up there. Uh, I got oh, it. you can get that online. Okay. Yeah, go to our uh, group website and uh, you can uh, look use the labels for Library of Michigan and it's like the second article that comes up, you'll see the link to apply for the card if you're a Michigan resident. It's free. Oh, it's just you. a couple business days to get it. Okay, thank you very much. M Mary Lou, this is Dara Brooks. Yes, Dara. That was an outstanding presentation. It just warmed my heart to know so much about this man. And it's really interesting because you do find in families that sometimes there's one, one person that doesn't treat, treat the elder very well. And it must have been something really terrible that they had to you know, relinquish his guardianship. But I so enjoyed all of the, the articles, the letters, the rich photographs, just how you put the presentation together. It was, it was very enjoyable. And I just, I now have a, a warm spot in my heart for this man. Th thank you. I felt the same way, even though I, he was probably an alcoholic. But a lot of those people, <laughs> I know. <laughs> a lot of the people but, lived but in- But think of all the tragedies, all the tragedies in his life. Right. I, I, I thought, I think there might have been even another child that died that was a young child that died in that time frame. Uh, I can't definitely pin it to them, but I think it was their child. And the other thing I noticed was in the 1870 census, the two younger daughters in the family were moved over to their uncle's house and he and his wife were taking care of them. And I think after the two murders, they probably figured <laughs> better to get them out of the house because there was no mother there. The father was gone during the day with his job. So he wasn't there. There was nobody to supervise him. And that happens when there's nobody to supervise the children. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Dara, are you ready to go? Okay. Okay. We see your starting slide. Good. That was painful. <laughs> It gets easier from now. <laughs> yes. I've only done this a thousand times. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this topic is something that I brought up in my writing group. Um, Ann Faulkner, as you know, I was a member of the writing group back in Michigan. And I told you that when I went to Florida that I would start one. And I have. And I think we're coming up on three years now. And uh, timelines was um, a topic that we tackled in our writing group. And I did a presentation on Prince Pruitt of Midway, of Midway, Alabama. And I presented it. And since that time, I've been working on it again to refine it. And that's what this is about. Okay. So Timelines, charts, and other visuals are a great way to view information in a picturesque form. Since we all learn differently, it stands to reason that we see things differently. And in my case, being a painter, I'm very visual. So when I extended my research of my paternal grandmother's line to a collateral line, I was immediately met with an obstacle. And that brings me to the star of this little show and my base subject, Prince Pruitt. I immediately noted that there was no records of him prior to 1900, so I had to improvise. That made me wonder about his life before 1900 and the missing lady of the house. The title of this member medley is called Using Timelines, Charts, and Other Visuals to Identify the Mother of the Children of Prince Pruitt of Midway, Alabama. So since my first record was the 1900 census, what I did is I created this visual of the children. So he was whittled by this time. And according to the record, he was born about 1854. You know, they said he was 46 years old. So he had seven children in his household, ranging in age from six to 22. Now, I wondered who he'd been married to and who the mother of his children were. 
So I started by creating this variation on the descendant chart and put in the information that was represented in that 1900 census record. Now, this, this household was in Midway B, Bullock County, Alabama. And that's where a lot of my research is. That's a, a lot of my ancestors came from this, this uh, county in Alabama. So since I was unable to find any records to, to prior to 1900, I was surprised to find a Prince Pruitt in the 1867 voter re registration. And that was in precinct one, election district seven. So since I found a Prince Pruitt in the 1867 voter registration, which was for precinct one and election district seven in Midway, I wondered, could this be the same guy? But I wasn't sure. Next, my next step was to research all the kids in the household and gather as much information as I could on them. And this included tracking the kids, you know, through their marriages, having babies, even to their death. And in doing so, I was able to identify two additional children of princes. Uh, in 1900, they were already adults and they were out of the household. So I discovered Nathan Anderson Pruitt and in the records, he was called Nathan, sometimes he was called N.A. Uh, but his 1955 death record identified his parents as Prince Pruitt and Laura McCraney and his birth as Clayton, Barber County, Alabama. I also identified Lawrence Pruitt um, in his um, April 1930 Birmingham, Alabama household. His father, 76 year old Prince was identified there. So here are the clues that helped me to connect the children to the mother and to Prince Pruitt. I talked about Nathan already. Um, he had a son, Harrison and um, Prince and a mother, Laura, was identified in Harrison's June 1965 Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania death record. Also, his birthplace was identified as Midway in his World War I draft registration card filed in Youngstown, Ohio. So we've got more clues there. We've got a connection back to uh, Barbara County. We've got the name Laura McCraney. We, we know that Harrison, he, uh, he lived in Pittsburgh for a while. Uh, he also lived in Ohio for a while. Lawrence, his father was found in his household in 1930. And then Mickey, which is a sister, um, in her death record in February of 1945, also in Pittsburgh, her parents were identified as Prince and Laura. So, that led me to looking very closely at Barbara County. And when I did that, I found in 1870, I found Prince and Laura Kennedy. Now, I didn't find any Prince Pruitt. I didn't find a, a Laura McCraney, but I found Prince and Laura Kennedy. And what led me to that is that I found a marriage record for Prince Kennedy and Laura McCraney. That led me to the 1870 census record. And in that record, not only did I find the young couple, because remember, they got married in June, the census record was you know, just a couple months later, and I find these other people in the household. Primer is a female. And at 25 years old, she could have been the, the mother of these other children. And I say that because based upon the ages giving, actually the birth years giving of Prince and Laura, he was about 20 and she's about 18. So it, I, this is obviously a speculation because certainly women can have children earlier, but I suspect that these are Kremer's kids. Next, I went to the 1880 census. And when I did that, I found that Prince Kennedy 
and Laura still lived in Barber County. And this time the community was identified as Clayton and Clayton refers back to the place where their older son, Nathan was born. So at this time they made Prince much earlier, much, much older, Laura much older, but then they had children. Nathan born in 1868, Lawrence born in 1870, Ida, Ada born in 1875, Mackie in 1876, Webb in 1878, and then a baby which was unnamed in 1879. So I had to ask myself, was it plausible that this Prince and Laura Kennedy were the parents of the children that I found in the 1900 census? And so, First of all, I said, how far away is Clayton from Midway? And it turned out it's only 20 miles, which that makes it plausible. Because 20 miles, that's nothing, especially today, that's nothing. Even back then, people did a lot of walking, but still 20 miles is not that far. So I thought it's a possibility that this is the same family. <clears throat> so then I went and I, and I created a, a chart that lined up those children. Nathan was found in the um, 1880 census with his parents. He's also found um, as an adult and as a, the child of Prince Pruitt. So, and, and born in the same counties. Now, as you can see, we know from record to record that sometimes the years differ. We also have Lawrence, who was one of the original children. And he was tied to his father because um, his, he was listed as his father in the census record in 1930. He, he was old enough to have his own household, so he wasn't in the 1900. So Lawrence matches up because same name, just has an initial. The birth dates are about four years apart. Uh, Barbara County is in Alabama. The other record says he's in Alabama. Mackie is a female. She was identified in the uh, 1900 uh, census record with her dad. She had a Barber County birth. I found her as an adult and her death record says her name was um, probably Missia and maybe Mickey for short and Mickey could be Mackie depending upon who was writing it. And the birth dates are very far apart here, but we don't know about record keeping. And the other children, Ada or Ada, Webb, and then the baby Kennedy that was unnamed with their respective birth dates in uh, Barber County. We don't know what happened to them. There, were, there could have been a number of things. Maybe they died young. Somehow they didn't survive. So I think I, I, I got a pretty good case here. So then I asked myself, you know, what happened to these people? And what happened to the other children? And did the move to Barber County, from Barber County to Bullock County signal connection between Prince Pruitt and other Pruitts in Bullock County? But I also began to examine the possibility that Barber County was where the enslavers were. And I found two likely candidates. As you can see, 1850 and 1860, we see a, a, a slaveholder, William Kennedy. In 1850, he had four enslaved uh, people. And when I looked at the ages and the, the makeup of the sex, it looked like it could have been a, a, a family. 1860, I see one enslaved male, age 14. Another candidate was the brother, John Kennedy. He was also a slaveholder. 1850, he had four enslaved people. And in 1860, he had eight enslaved people. So, I don't know if, if these people were actually enslaved. I know that I have 
enough information that kind of helped me to piece some things together. So I think I have, a, I think I have a good case. I think there's, there's a lot more to uncover and lots of places to start. For instance, um, when we think of Prince Pruitt, the subject here, I have a, I have a reference from one of his death, death uh, records that says his father was named Jake. Now, even though it didn't have his surname, I, I was really inspired by that information because he was carrying the Pruitt name at the time of his death. And one of the collateral families that I was, that I've been tracking for, I wanna say a hundred years was Jacob Pruitt. And Jacob had, a, uh, he had six known children. And one of Jacob's sons, his name was Lawson. His children and Prince's children, they intermingled because they all moved to Birmingham, Alabama. And they, they were neighbors. They went to the same church. And a couple of them as cousins even started a business together. So I think I'm on the right track. Also, um, Jake's, Jacob Pruitt's other son was named Anderson Pruitt. And this may be a clue to something in the past for this Pruitt family because Anderson Pruitt and then Prince's, Prince's oldest son is Nathan Anderson Pruitt. So I'm wondering if that name Anderson has something to do with the background, maybe some, some uh, person they had in common or an ancestor or something. Um, and I speculate that if they're you know, if they're cousins, this, this may be a way of bringing down the, one of the family names. So some of the questions that arise from my research are, who was the Prince Pruitt found in the 1867 voter registration for Midway, Precinct 1, District 7? Was it my Prince Kennedy? Now, according to uh, the requirements for being able to register as a vote, you have to be at least 21 years of age. If Prince Kennedy was not, uh, was only 21 years old in 1870, then he was too young to have registered to vote. Or did they just get the information wrong? And, and secondly, maybe there's a whole nother person that I need to be tracking. And if there is another person that I need to be tracking, whatever happened to him? Because I found numerous Prince Pruitts in the records, but one of them is, is significantly younger. And unfortunately, if you look online at Ancestry and all these other trees, you'll find that people, they just grab people with the same name. So even though we have this Prince, Pru Prince Pruitt that's much younger, they have him attached to kids that are older than he is. So. That's why we have to really scrutinize this information really closely. The other thing that I have to find out is, you know, how are the 1870 householders back in Barber County, Primer, uh, Babe, Calvin, James, and Sarah, how are they connected to the family? Thus far, I've not been able to find anything about them. Um, I do have like a Calvin Pruitt, but there's not, there's just a name, there's not enough information to even tie him back. I can't find Krimer, I can't find them under the Kennedy name or variations. So, but I've only looked in the two counties, so I've got some more work to do. So I asked myself, um, can I tie the families to the former enslavers? And it's possible, but that's a, you know, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. And I suspect that Prince may have been that 14 year old male listed in William Kennedy's household. And I say that because the age is kind of a line and it, it, it would kind of make sense if somewhere along the line, the family was separated and they kept uh, the young man because he was coming of age and he could be a good worker and maybe the rest of the family was sold off to someplace else. And then that might account for him uh, as an adult taking his family and moving it to the area where the other Pruitts were. And then finally, you know, how do I uncover additional a documentation to account for all the children's mother? Because so far I have not, I have not been able to verify 
that Laura is the mother of the rest of the children. And with her having been having passed away before 1900, and that's because Prince had the, um, he was listed as a widower in 1900, then I know no children born after that date could have been her children. But not knowing exactly when she passed away, I don't know if all of the children in that 1900 record were her children. So I've got some more work to do there. And in a lot of cases, I've tracked those children to their death. And all they do is they list Prince as their father and they don't list the mother. And I speculated about that a little bit. I thought maybe, you know, if she died when they were very, very young, then they don't have memories of her and they may not list her just for that reason. So in conclusion, the use of timelines, charts, and other visuals made it easy for me to see what I was working with and what questions needed to be answered. And though I still have outstanding hurdles, I believe I'm on the right track. That's it. Any questions for Dara? Go ahead and unmute and ask. Hey, Dara. Judy. Oh, sorry. I had a question. Go ahead. Oh, um, has DNA helped you at all with some of that research or maybe finding that mother? It has not. Hmm. I've, um, you know, I've taken tests um, and uh, unfortunately my, my dad is passed, so I didn't have his DNA information, but I did have his brother who unfortunately just passed this year and I uploaded it to JetCom, JetMatch and um, I, don't, I don't have any matches at this time. And as we know, as we know, you know, each person doesn't necessarily match someone they're related to. Everybody doesn't get that DNA. So just because I've not found any matches thus far doesn't mean they're not out there. Correct. And I noticed because I'm I did 23andMe and Ancestry, and I have sometimes there's some common matches, but then I noticed on 23andMe I have a set of matches, different people are on 23 and me is what I'm trying to say, than an our ancestry. And I noticed yeah. that too yeah. different. And you, and you kinda you kind of want them to be different people because yes. they they test differently and you know it it kind of gives you a bigger pool to draw from. But what's really interesting is I I've been back to Bullock County a number of times and Early on, people used to always say that I needed to talk to this one guy, it was Calvin. And Calvin and I are supposed to be related. He's a Pruitt and I'm related to the Pruitts because my grandmother is a Pruitt, my paternal grandmother is a Pruitt. And, and, and Calvin took me around and introduced me to people and we went to cemeteries. And so I've documented the cemeteries, I've been to the courthouse, I've been to, to all of that, excuse me. And then Calvin told me that I needed to talk to one gentleman that lived there. And he happened to be a historian. And he decided, for God bless him, <laughs> he decided that he was going to document this whole community. And he had done a lot of extensive work. And I was able to find um, some information that, that helped me. So. That's pretty cool. You never know who will be your resource. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And Calvin actually descends from that Jacob Pruitt line. So he was able to give me uh, not only some information, but take me to um, the places where some of the ancestors lived and things that I see on maps. We've actually been to those places. So it's, it's added a lot of, a, a lot of depth. To That's a great resource. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Good presentation. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I feel like an idiot. I've done this a thousand times and then I couldn't find the button and oh my God. <laughs> we have all been there, so don't worry about it. <laughs> 
Any other questions for Dara? Well, it appears there's no other questions. Great job by all three presenters. Dara, you did very good. You did very good also, Mary Lou and Lisa. Great job as always. Um, I think, and Lisa chime in here. I think we can probably call it an evening. And probably, unless, unless yeah. someone else has a genealogy question. We're always available through email, and also um, if you need some assistance, we are still doing the volunteer genie in a box. Just uh, email and ask for the link. Yes. And we'll make an appointment for you. What's the genealogy in the box? Um, the volunteer genie in a box is because uh, the library's been... Um, closed and under renovation when we they've been a temporary site and there was really no room to um, have volunteers in uh, and stuff to work with we came up with um, kind of a one-on-one -on -one by appointment uh, meet with a volunteer who's you know experienced um, working with you know patrons in the library and um, getting together one-on-one -on -one and trying to help them figure out where to look and what to look at to solve uh, problems or questions they have. Okay, thank you. Well, if no one has any questions this time, we will see you maybe in August um, at Harrison Township Public Library. Otherwise, uh, we'll keep in touch via email and we'll see you virtually, at least for September, and then hopefully uh, in person via hybrid meeting um, in October. If you have any um, meeting topic ideas, let us know. Email the gg at gmail.com and let us know your ideas. Thanks, and we'll see And we'll see what works. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, great, great information tonight. Enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Night. Thank you, Stephanie. Good night. Yes. Thank you for watching. We will see you in September 2022 for our fall season. Last but not least, MCGG extends its thanks to the Mount Clemens Public Library and its staff for hosting this Zoom meeting. Goodbye, everyone.